My task is to drill down a little bit, uh, just for a very few minutes, uh, into some aspects of, of the European situation. Um, on the brink, seems like a safe title. On the brink of what? Or who is on the brink? Now, in, in addition to providing us with, with, with a highly plausible macroeconomic, global macroeconomic forecast, Mike Muss's paper contains, I think, one of the most elegant and forceful, well, perhaps not elegant, but forceful statements of, 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 of principle with regard to banking policy uh, that, that, that I have seen recently, and I follow these matters carefully. Um, for those of you at the back, I'll read it to you. He says, on, it's on page seven of the distributed version, the time has long since passed for public officials and central banks to stop kissing and start kicking the posteriors of bankers whose self-interest diverges substantially from the public interest. What he means, and he says this quite clearly in, in his paper, is there's a need to raise capital ratios of European banks uh, to reflect the risks of the falling market value of sovereign debt holdings, um, primarily in, in Europe. They need, uh, if I paraphrase it slightly, and they need more loss-absorbing shareholder equity relative to their assets. And, and the right approach, Mike, uh, obviously this place doesn't, this wasn't his focus of his paper, and he can speak for himself uh, shortly, but I, th I, I think he would agree um, that the right approach is to use tough stress tests to determine who has what kind of potential losses. And this is obviously something that hasn't yet happened um, in, in Europe. After two rounds of tests, we, we really don't know uh, who could face what kind of losses, and, we, and there isn't confidence in the market that enough capital is in place. Now, similar ideas have been articulated, as I'm sure you're aware, by uh, Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF. Um, and this is, this is one long quote from her Jackson Hole uh, prepared remarks. Uh, let me just uh, highlight the, the middle part of the quote. The most efficient, she, she's very much on the same page, I think, uh, with regard to, to what needs to be done broadly. She thinks that uh, the most efficient solution would be mandatory substantial recapitalization seeking private resources first, but using public funds if, if necessary. And she proposes, and actually um, uh, Mike has some numbers um, in, in his paper around uh, this kind of proposal, and, and I think that's probably similar to what we'll see coming out from IMF documents in the next couple of weeks. But she says we could, uh, or the Europeans could mobilize the European Financial Stability Fund or other European-wide funding to recapitalize banks directly, and therefore avoid placing even greater burdens on vulnerable sovereigns. Now, the reaction of the European banking community has been um, categorical, in fact, the policy community in Europe. And, and I'm going to call this, uh, just, just for, for, because I need a shorthand, uh, Ackerman's rule, um, which, of course, you could interpret the rule in a number of ways here. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, Joseph Ackerman, the, the head of Deutsche Bank, uh, said um, last week um, that um, First of all, what's, de what's been demanded from well-known figures that banks face mandatory recapitalizations, I think nothing at all of that. That was one quote. Um, at, at, I think, the same event, but uh, quoted in a different news story, he said, and I think this is, this is the most important part of Ackerman's rule, um, it is stating the obvious that many European banks would not survive having to revalue sovereign debt held on the banking book at market levels. And I, and I, th I think that's, that's actually true. Uh, and I think that is the heart of the, 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 the financial problem, the, the, the downside risk, I, I would suggest, to, to Mike's uh, forecast, and, and one that he talks about himself, um, and, and a big part of the political economy issue uh, now unfolding um, in, uh, in Europe, particularly in, in Frankfurt. Now, ju just, just to pause for a moment and, and to put some numbers uh, on, on Ackerman's rule. Uh, the, these slides are not in your package, but we're happy to, to share, them with you, uh, share them with you afterwards. And all my, I did uh, put footnotes in there for those of you who'd like to go away and look at this stuff for yourself. All the Deutsche Bank data uh, come from their website. This is, this is their uh, uh, second quarter uh, financial results. Do Deutsche Bank, uh, so Mr. Ackerman said in, in the context of these other remarks I just quoted, he said Deutsche Bank is more strongly capitalized than ever before, and he said it's ap having absolutely no problems with refinancing, all, all of which I, I have no no reason to, to dispute. And, and I would stress I'm only picking Deutsche Bank as, as an example, um, and, and perhaps an example of, of a relatively well-run and perhaps a relatively uh, well-capitalized uh, bank in, in the European context. And that we, we don't know because the stress tests have not, have not revealed it. Deutsche Bank at the end of the second quarter had assets of around uh, 1.85 trillion euros. It had total equity of about um, 51, slightly over 51 billion euros. So the assets has a trillion, 
and the, the equity is billion. And, and the difference between those, or the ratio of assets to equity, of course, um, the simplest measure of leverage is about 36. Deutsche Bank, uh, to be clear, prefers a different measure of leverage, a lower measure, uh, but th this one they also confirm um, and, and report on the relevant part of their, their website. Now, the capital ratio of Deutsche Bank, and, and, and remember, what, or let me remind you, that what Mr. Ackerman spoke to very specifically is capitalization. Capitalization is a, is a regulatory concept, among, among other things, and Deutsche Bank, uh, like all banks, um, has a, a ratio which they, which they are uh, required to attain and, and a ratio that they want to communicate to the market. Um, this does not use total assets. This uses uh, what's known as risk-weighted assets. And the risk-weighted assets of Deutsche Bank at the end of the second quarter were 320 billion euros. Now, when you calculate the capital ratios, equity relative to risk-weighted assets, um, you get numbers that, that are high, considered high, in, in today's banking world. They, Deutsche had a tier one capital of 14%. That was up um, nearly 2% from the end of 2010. And it had a core tier one capital in which you remove hybrid uh, instruments that are not generally considered to be as loss absorbing as shell equity. It had a core tier one uh, capital ratio of 10.2%. Now that, that counts as a, as a well capitalized bank. Um, but th the key issue here is, is the risk weighting. How do you get from 1.8, 1.9 trillion euros, the total value of assets, on Deutsche Bank's balance sheet, how do you get to a risk-weighted asset position of 320 billion euros? Well, I don't know the full degree of detail. That's not revealed, has not been revealed by uh, the stress test in, 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 in enough detail to give us confidence. But the uh, one's presumption should be that there are, they are holding a substantial amount of, they and other banks, this is not, again, not, nothing special about Deutsche Bank. They are holding a, a large number of assets that have a, a zero or near zero uh, risk weight. Now, what would be those assets? Um, they, they may well be, uh, they may well be uh, holding some uh, subprime uh, mortgages, uh, securitized, which as you know, Standard & Poor's uh, continues, uh, in some instances, to give a AAA rating to. Quite, quite, a, quite a striking contrast with their rating of, of, of US government debt. But for the most part, I think we can presume that these European banks are holding large amounts of European sovereign debt. Now, not, this is not to say that Deutsche Bank is holding a Greek debt. Deutsche Bank may not even be holding Spanish or, or Italian debt. But other banks in the European context are holding that debt. And other banks in the European context are also not marking to market. They're not following the Musa principle or the Lagarde proposal, and they have no intention of doing so. And there are no stress tests in, in the works or plans that would reveal the full extent of the potential issue here. If you scale Ackerman, so Ackerman's rule basically is that one could absorb a small amount of losses, for example, in, in a Greek restructuring deal. But it has to be contained and limited and ring-fenced to Greece. If it spreads, if there are actual losses, actual restructurings, of course, this is where Carmen's historical evidence is, is um, uh, highly relevant and, 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 deep, and deeply worrying, um, either actual restructurings or just a reduction in the market value. And Mike explains to you in his paper why you should care about the reduction in market value, even if there aren't actual defaults, and why one should expect contractionary effects if the banks don't have enough capital, even without defaults. If they don't have enough capital, this is what's going to play a big role in exacerbating uh, the slowdown. Now, there are different ways to scale this. There's no perfect way to think about debt to GDP. It depends on whose GDP we're talking about and how much debt we think is being pushed towards relatively solvent countries. It also depends, as, as Mike says in, in his paper, on, your take, on your, the view that you take of the primary surplus uh, in Italy. M Mike, Mike is a, a little bit more optimistic about that looking forward than I think I would be uh, on the basis of the latest data. But we, we don't know um, wh where, where this goes. The point, I, though, I would, I would emphasize is, is, is very much consistent with what Carmen just told you, which is there are many ways to hang yourself 
in, in terms of fiscal, losing your fiscal sustainability. One way that Carmen talked about that actually everyone in this room should be fully aware of is the morphing of private sector debt into public sector debt, which is what's happened in the United States. But another way to do it is to run large deficits. That's part of what happened in, in, in some places uh, in Europe. Um, or to run a high level of public debt during a boom, relying predominantly on bank financing, resting on what we used to call Basel II principles. Now, of course, this is still in Basel III, largely unchanged, which is putting a very low risk weight on sovereign debt. Sovereign debt, Carmen's history tells you that if there is just one thing you should know about sovereign debt, only one thing, it's not risk-free. And that's not a statement limited to, 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 to Greece. Now, I don't have time to go through with you the, the full sort of alternative ways of analyzing this. And, and this, this um, the, the, the countries, in, 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 just, just in the display of this, uh, of this, um, of the, of this slide, the, the, the countries' uh, names you can't read. And that's just to make you uh, go look at the paper for yourself. This is a very nice paper produced by Jonathan Ostry, Atish Ghosh, June Kim, and Mavash Qureshi. Uh, an IMF staff position note from September of last year called Fiscal Space on the IMF's website. And, and they, they go through a, a, a one, one form of analysis you can do of thinking about um, who has the ability to increase their debt to GDP without running into sustainability issues. And it's based on the historical experience um, of, of, these, of these countries. And, and the, the thing I would flag for you, this is a paper you, you should look at or print out in color. It doesn't work in black and white. And the reason is that their color, they have a suitably technical and, 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 and delicate way of presenting this, because they're, they're, they're very um, good IMF officials. Um, but uh, the countries that are colored in red, if you'd read this paper September, September last year and bet against the countries that were colored red here, you'd have done very well. These are the countries that are running out of fiscal space. These are the countries that, that are in danger, were in danger in their analysis of going too far in terms of jet, debt to GDP and not being able to bring it down and bring it under control. Countries that can't do sufficient fiscal adjustment. Um, and and I, I would suggest that anybody who's seriously interested in this issue, anybody who wants to think um, about the plausible alternatives uh, in Europe, start with, start with this uh, paper by Austria et, et al. In conclusion, I think I would say there are three three kinds of financial fiscal disasters, if I can offer a, a classification that fits, I think, with Carmen's broader view. The first, you, you, you know all about, you've seen the HBO special, you've heard about it ad nauseum in, in, in the American context, it's, it's called Too Big to Fail. Uh, my favorite quote actually comes um, from Canada, because so many Americans are convinced that the Canadian bank system is, is wonderful. Um, Ed Clark, who is uh, CEO of Tor Toronto Dominion Bank, you see it all around town here as TD Bank, said in January 2009, quote, maybe not explicitly, but what are the chances that TD Bank will not be bailed out if it did something stupid? That, that's banking philosophy uh, 101. And of course, it, 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 the, the, the license plate, the license plate that's worth a thousand words on this is that of, of Robert Kindler, the vice chairman of Morgan Stanley after the crisis. If you can't see it at the back, it, uh, it's a Cayenne uh, Turbo, a, a, a type of Porsche uh, with Greenwich plates, and it says, too big to fail. Um, so that's number one. Number two, of course, number two, of course, is the Irish. So that's too big to fail. Number two is the Irish variant, which is too big to save. Three big banks, two times GDP, they blow themselves up. The efforts to save them, the efforts to save the Irish banks ruin the Irish fiscal accounts and plunge them into an unsustainable situation uh, fr from which that one can only hope they will be rescued. Uh, by the, the joint efforts of the IMF and, 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 the, and the European Union. So we, ha we have too big to fail and, and too big to save. We also have what's, what's known in the philanthropic world as a naming opportunity, <laughs> which, which, is, which, is the, which is the current European situation. And, and I don't know, they're too something to something, but this is for, you can make a name for yourself by coining the term. Um, it, I can only uh, turn to, to the, the, the remarkable, if, if not stunning, events of the past 24 hours, um, where we had uh, Jean-Claude Truchet give this impassioned defense uh, of, of the impeccable, a word he uses repeatedly, impeccable, uh, impeccable um, 
record of the European Central Bank with regard to price stability. It, if you haven't seen the video clip of this, you must go look at it uh, this afternoon. In fact, Jacob Kierkegaard, if he's here, can send it to you with a, with a great commentary that he has. Uh, but you must look at this. It, it's really remarkable television, among other things. And, and of course, this morning, Jürgen Stark, um, the um, governing uh, executive committee member, um, a German national at the European Central Bank, announced that he's resigning, um, effective at the end of the year. And just um, to quote the Wall Street Journal news alert I got on this topic, not that anybody's had a chance to write a full story yet, um, the person familiar with the matter said Mr. Stark is leaving due to a conflict over the bank's bond purchase program. This is where it, the Ackerman rule goes. If you can't have big, serious fiscal restructuring, because that will, among other things, bring down all the banks and therefore exacerbate the fiscal problems massively. Everyone's looking at the central bank, the European Central Bank, to buy the bonds, presumably, of countries that are in trouble, including, we know they've done this already for, for Spain and, and, and for Italy. And this um, leads to the naming opportunity. It leads to a huge fight, one presumes, at the European Central Bank. And I, and I think it, it poses both uh, downside risks to, to the growth projection and, and presumably uh, downside or inflationary um, risks to uh, the, the price uh, forecast that, that Mike laid out as well. Thank you.